Witch Trials Weekly, Video 19, May the 20th to May the 26th, 1692. Mercy Lewis's near-death experience. Mercy Lewis was the only person still bothered by Mary Eastie's spectre. At this time, she was staying with Constable John Putnam, neighbor and cousin of her former employer, Thomas. She was probably brought there because Anne Putnam Sr. couldn't continue to care for her in addition to everybody else, especially after her own fits came back during John Willard's examination. On May 20th, Mercy was pinned in bed wordless. Hannah Putnam asked Samuel Abbey to bring Anne Putnam Jr. over to identify the specter hurting Mercy. Anne, Sarah Trask, who wasn't afflicted, and Abigail Williams were brought over. They identified Mary Eastie, John Willard, and Mary Witheridge's specters. Mary Walcott came over as well and said Mary Eastie had blinded all the girls to the truth before, and only Mercy Lewis knew that she was still guilty. Supposedly, Mary Eastie's specter had sworn to kill Mercy before midnight. When Constable John Putnam returned home with Marshal George Herrick and Benjamin Hutchinson, they found Mercy Lewis seemingly dead. They thought the only way to save her was to arrest Mary Eastie before midnight. Elizabeth Hubbard joined the girls as they stayed up all night while Mercy was taunted by Mary Eastie's specter holding a corpse's winding sheets. Mercy Lewis's illness of two days and one night of almost continual seizures was stopped only when Mary Eastie was clapped in irons. Complaints were entered against Susanna Roots, Sarah Proctor, and Sarah Bassett, who had supposedly afflicted the girls while they were helping Mercy. Susanna Sheldon regained her senses on May 22nd after being struck deaf, dumb, and blind. Philip English also tried to make her sign the book until the ghost of Joseph Rapson stopped him and told Susanna to avenge his murder by English. By now, every disastrous death was being blamed on witches. The examinations of Sarah Bassett and Sarah Roots probably took place on the 23rd. Mary Eastie's new examination was also that day. Most of the evidence against her was to do with Mercy Lewis's near-death experience. The girls were being choked by her specter, some even being stabbed with a spindle. A spindle had gone missing from a spinning wheel at a nearby home, and when one of the girls said she was being stabbed with it, it appeared, probably being pulled out of a hiding place. Mary Eastie was sent back to jail. More complaints were issued against Benjamin Proctor, his aunt Mary DeRich, and Sarah Pease. They were all questioned on the 23rd, but no notes survive. Elizabeth Carey started as an onlooker and then was accused. She and her husband, Captain Nathaniel Carey, showed up unannounced to the examinations. He thought the proceedings were stylized and unconvincing. They tried to arrange a private meeting with Abigail Williams in the parsonage. The best Reverend Hale was able to arrange was an interview at Ingersoll's. The girls cried out against her, but she protested her innocence. John Indian fell on the floor and took Elizabeth Carey down with him. She was held for trial, and her husband hoped God would take vengeance on the court. She was brought to the Boston jail, but was later moved to Cambridge. She was shackled with eight-pound chains after her first night and had convulsions so severe she thought she would die. Nothing Captain Carey said could get the prison keepers to remove Elizabeth's chains. This video was produced with special permission from the author, Marilyn K. Roach, and publisher Cooper Square Press. The Salem Witch Trials, a day-by-day -day chronicle of a community under siege, covers the years 1692 to 1697 in detail. It also touches briefly on important and relevant events before and after this time. We are proud to carry all of Ms. Roach's books and publications in our museum store. To get a copy for your personal research and enjoyment, please visit www.salemwitchmuseum.com.